January 9th at 4 p.m. and based on proper notice, I called meeting to order. Our first order of business will be the reading of the minutes of our last meeting. You last met on April 24th, 2014 here at the ACD uh, office. Um, those present were John Bryan, Keith Harrison, A.J. Myers, Al L. Parkey Jr., Elma Richardson, Don Scott, J.C. Dixon, and Philip L. Smart constituting all the members of the board with the exception of Andy Smith who was absent. Chairman Smart noted that Mr. Edwin Brown had left the board after many years of faithful service to the board and the community. Um, Chairman Smart welcomed Mr. Harrison who has been appointed by, to the board by the county mayor and county commission. Mr. Smart and Mr. Richardson have been reappointed to the board. Um, motion duly made and seconded. Minutes of the previous meeting on December 19, 2013 were read and approved. Board reviewed and approved the most recent financial report presented by the treasurer. Chairman Stark Smart stated that without objection, they would appoint a subcommittee to review the bylaws and policies of the board and make recommendations back to the board. He stated that it had been several years since these items had been reviewed and he felt they should be reviewed in light of the current of the county's current incentive plan. Mr. Rochelle presented the report of debt obligation in regard to the Starbucks bond issue. Motion Mr. Bryan, say Mr. Partey, and unanimously carried. The report was reviewed and approved. Chairman Smart then recognized attorney Joe Gibbs with Bradley Arant Bolton Cummings, who explained the incentive program and proposed project relating to CSHV Mount Juliet LLC and involving Hollister Incorporated. He also presented a proposed report on the debt obligation. This is a total $20 million project which is qualified for a two-year incentive program with 100% of Mount Juliet city taxes to be paid through the in lieu of tax agreement. Chairman Smart stated that the board would stand in recess to allow any member of the public to speak as to the proposal no one sought recognition. Chairman Smart declared the public hearing concluded. Mr. Rochelle stated that he had reviewed the resolution and pilot agreements for consideration by the board and all documents approved therein and found them to be in order. On no motion of Mr. Richardson, seconded by Mr. Scott, and unanimously carried, the board approved the resolution and pilot agreements and directed that the copy be placed in the minutes and also approved the computation of the board premium. Chairman Smart proposed that the board authorize a dinner for public officials after the conclusion of local elections to acquaint new officers with the efforts of the county, including this board, in attracting new jobs and investments to the community. On motion of Chairman Smart, seconded by Mr. Richardson, unanimously carried, the board appropriated from its fund balance a sum of $10,000 for the purposes outlined by Chairman Smart. No further business. You've heard the reading of the minutes. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? If none, do I have a motion to approve? So I have a motion by Mr. Meyer. Is there a second? Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. That was key to the second. Uh, you have before you a treasurer's report that was prepared by Mr. Richardson and uh, any questions? If so, I'll try to answer <coughs> them. By the GC. If there are no questions, the chairman will accept the motion to approve. So moved. Moved by Mr. Scott. Seconded. Second. Mr. Bryant. Let the record show Mr. Bryant's present. I, I told him what you told me yesterday morning. Yeah. <laughs> All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh -huh. Opposed? Motion carries. Turn to the board is accepted. Well, Mr. Mark, what happens to the CDs? They all mature within the next six months or whatever. But Treasurer takes care of it. Yep. <coughs> you don't want to use the checks or gets tamed. And we'll build them around and see what the highest rate is on them. And that's a standard procedure to do that. Standard procedure. Okay. And we, you know, FDIC <coughs> limits you to 150000 uh, not 250 But from a government standpoint, we try not to go uh, over 150000 150 with each institution. 
Um, but we are covered up to the 250. Auditor checks out every year that we do it to see it. Right now we've got more than 100 with Wilson Bank. Um, so we'll take a look at that when we do it. I know John Cedarstone's down there, so we'll work, work them all and see what we get. Maybe rates go up a little bit. We have an official item of business today. Um, Mr. Rochelle may be able to speak to that more directly than I can. Um, it's an issue to deal with Amazon. Yes. Um, you got my sign talk to This is the yeah. <coughs> We'll pass these around. I'll tell you what this is. Um, this deals with the Amazon project. I've received a notice that uh, new LLC, AR, or LLC, AR, CPID 1110 LLC has agreed to purchase the premises subject to that lease agreement dated December 20, 2011, which was the Amazon lease. They're purchasing the property from U.S. Real Estate Limited Partnership, which is a Texas limited partnership. They own the property. They leased it to some, it eventually ended up being leased to Amazon. Um, has requested the board to state its knowledge in regard to the present status of the lease. Chairman has previously, previously executed a chairman's certificate as to his knowledge of the status of the lease. Um, under the, again, the way it's phrased is that um, uh, you don't have any knowledge of any um, of, you don't have any knowledge that the lease is not in full force and effect still. You don't have any knowledge that um, that the lease um, has had any changes or termination rights or purchase options, nor have any of them been exercised. It's again, it's to the knowledge of this board. All conditions <coughs> are determined. Um, the knowledge that no existing default and to the knowledge of the, the board, there's no existing defenses or offsets which the board has against the tenant. No sums are currently payable by the tenant to the landlord. And then upon conveyance of the tenant's leasehold interest to the purchaser, the purchaser shall be acknowledged as tenant, the original tenant be released from all liability. Now, again, it's not a big deal. They set up a little LLC to own the property well, excuse me, they've set up a little LLC to own the property. The previous owner is just is selling the property. So that's, they want that that's it from us that we've done nothing else with the property as far as any other bonded business or leases or anything like that. Mark Smith, who is um, the attorney, if y'all remember Mark, he's written a letter to you basically stating what I've just told you, that he's not aware of any problem with the police and um, asking that you approve the execution of the estoppel agreement. So I would ask your favorable consideration of the estoppel agreement. And would we all have to sign or just the designated just chair? The chair. Just chair. And again, it's, it's to our knowledge as far as we know, everything's we know the same. Many, all things equal. Same. It's That's all good. Yeah. And I know we, we accept this assignment. Yeah. Most to accept the assignment. Certificate and chairman sign it on behalf of the board. Is there a second? So moved. Second. Right, no second. Any further questions? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? None. Motion carries unanimous. Yeah, Mark, we gave the treasury report, we've already accepted it. Tell me, said, I'm GC, running the tail late, sorry. GC asked a question about the CDs, and I told him we'd bid them out, and we're a little over 100 with Wilson on that, so we probably need to spread that out a little bit in the future. John winked when I said that, so. <laughs> Just tell him to beat the rates. That's right, got to beat the rates. The other purpose of this meeting, the other purpose of this meeting was at the last meeting, I appointed a committee of myself and John, the GC, and Senator Rochelle to go over our bylaws and our board policies. It's been a number of years since we have 
looked at these and brought them up to date. And as I stated earlier, uh, there had been questions raised about why this board was not compensated uh, for their meetings. And that's a legitimate question. Uh, I marked a section to start with, if you want to look at it first, and then we'll get an order of what we're talking about. <coughs> We've got a red letter edition of both the uh, Industrial Development Board uh, policies and also their bylaws. Under the statement of board policy, if you go to page four and look under general requirements, item number two, it states there that the members of the board serve without pay. Um, your committee discussed that to see if we wanted to make another suggestion or recommend something else. Um, since it's in our policy and our policy is in compliance with state law, a request to amend that would have to go to the county commission, and the county commission would have to approve that. Some of the other statements that were made, and it even says in some of these documents that members of the board considered it to be an honor to be appointed to the board, felt like it was a citizen's responsibility to see that something like this existed, and due to, due to the irregularity and uh, no large number of meetings and so forth, it was decided to leave it as it is. So that's the recommendation of your committee it is to go over both of these documents. First, go over the uh, bylaws. And again, at the committee's suggestion, Tammy prepared a red letter edition of these so you can see what we're taking out and what we're putting in. Uh, as far as the bylaws were concerned, We recommended that Article 2, Section 6, relating to officer terms, be revised. We've been electing officers every year, and sometimes we don't meet them. Either. So it was recommended by the committee that we make those terms now two years. Um, also, there was a there is a section in there, Section 6, that Article 3, that gives a specific time that we're to have our annual meeting every year. Jan, I'm quoting by memory because I don't have my over, but I think it's January. June. Is it June? Yeah. First, first meeting in June or whatever. And we, we just don't have that many regular meetings. So we decided to, <coughs> so that I don't mislead y'all, I need to find a name. the annual meeting of the Board of Directors of Corporation shall be held the second Monday in June at 7 o'clock p.m. at the Office of the Corporation. Um, I might we, say normally it's annual meeting would be when the corporation would elect officers. The other provision says that you elect officers at your first meeting of the year in which the term is now. <coughs> it's so they complement each other. It's what I said earlier on the third page, I guess, of the bylaws. We strike all the section on election and insert the chairman, the vice chairman, two-year terms and the board at the first meeting of the board occurring after January 1 of the year in which the terms expire. Now let's, let's designate what that would be now because we elected officers at our last, no, it wasn't our last meeting. Back to it, but um, it was, who's the last? I think it was January or February. We we the first of the year so yeah. I think so. by this we would not have if we accept this we would not have an election next year but we have one the following year in our first meeting after January 1 so that would be 2016 whenever that meeting is whenever that meeting is it may not be until August of 2016 prior to whenever this it was we were hand, handcuffed to a certain date mm -hmm. and we never we just struck that out to kind of we didn't and we never, never, we never divided by that. We never divided by that. Right. It just didn't seem feasible to call it by together just for that. Right. So that was one of the changes <coughs> we made uh, with the annual meeting date being changed. And I 
that is all of the corrections or changes that we made to the bylaw. I'd like to take these one at a time. I'd like to take the bylaws and then, and then we'll take the other set next. But any questions about any of that? You know, one thing we ran across, and I talked to Senator yesterday, we got in our documents, we're named two different things. And one of them we're called the uh, Industrial Development Corporation of Wilson County. And then in another one we're called the Industrial Development Board of Wilson County. Uh, he says it's no consequence of what the two different names are. It's such a small difference. But, you know, over the years you start putting the name Bond Board in there and it suddenly becomes the Wilson County Industrial Development Bond Board. Bond didn't even enter a name, so we leave that out. But those are the are the changes we'd like to recommend on behalf of the committee. And this committee, I thank them all for meeting because we didn't just sit down over a cup of coffee one day and flip it and go through these things. We had three good hour-long meetings to go over these with some time to study them in the meantime. So these are thought out process, not just a nature. So. I need a motion to approve those uh, changes to the bylaws of the Industrial Development Corporation of Wilson County. I'll make that motion, Mr. Chairman. Motion by Mr. Richardson. I'll say. All right. And I'm still working on the name. I look at it, Keith. I don't look at the sheet. I look at the sheet. We didn't see the article in the newspaper about how triplet games. Yeah, I did. That's who he is. Okay. <laughs> Everybody's My wife was at the have something to be famous. <laughs> <laughs> we got a motion and a second. So all in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Changes here. All right, now let's go to the articles of the corporation. Statement of the Statement of the I'm sorry. We got a copy of the articles of the corporation, our little book that you see for well, we're going to do that. Board of policy. The Industrial Development Board of Wilson County board. Statement of Board Policy. And we've talked about this a number of times, but right there on the very first of eight, uh, subsection two, we talk about the minimum number of employees being 10 persons. Uh, we also, at one time, we were being under a guidance of pollution control projects getting certain and all that's gone by with the old time. So what we decided to substitute for that section was to be eligible a project must maintain and or expand significant employment opportunities and or investment in the community as determined by the board. So we took the number out of it and I think an example of that would be Georgia Pacific when they came asking for the new equipment and they wanted a bond issue there. That was not to create new jobs, but that was to retain about 60 jobs in Wilson County. So by the actual intent of what we had written here, that wouldn't have been in compliance with it. So this puts it at the discretion of the board if it's enough impact. Retain jobs or new jobs, whichever one. GC, you got anything? Before we take a proposal to the executive committee, a pilot proposal, to the executive committee or to the Wilson County Budget Committee, he goes through an evaluation, a scoring sheet. Uh, and in Georgia Pacific case, they didn't have employees, but they had a lot of investment in equipment. So it, they did qualify. So it's not a subjective recommendation for pilots. It's based on the investment, the wages, the number of jobs, what you get back in projects. So, I agreed with this and that, you know, putting $18 million of equipment in, the, in the Georgia Pacific, not creating jobs, but saving jobs, it is a good thing for the county. So, but we just don't bring projects up here without going through some type of evaluation. There's plenty of projects out there that just don't qualify. You know, $2 million investment and five jobs just doesn't get it. So. The industrial board doesn't see those, nor did the executive committee or the budget committee. But we go through that just about every project. Somebody asks, what can you do for us? Well, if you show me the best numbers, there may be something. It's still at the discretion of the, those that approve it and the 
discretion of this board to accept it. So, I don't know if that's as anything to it, but under section four on the next page at the top, more recommended update here. An older document referred to the county legislative body. And as you know, in recent times, I think GC said just once since 2007, we've adopted a pilot uh, program where each project that comes in is evaluated as far as its job impact, its amount of investment in fixed assets, and several other documents that come up to decide whether it, first of all, qualifies for a tax for a pilot. Second, how long the pilot is, is determined by the economic impact of the project. And that has to be taken to the county budget committee for approval. Is budget, am I right? Budget right. committee. Yeah. Yes. And, and the county commission back in 07 gave the budget committee the authority to approve those without going to the full commission. So by us saying that the board may require approval by a local legislative body before a tax incentive shall become effective, that brings us up to date with what our current process is by going to the budget committee, not the total county legislative body. So feel free to say that if, if you had love of it, was going to be affected by the project. And you could say we want to hear from Lebanon as to whether they are willing to waive taxes on to them. So it says a legislative, a local legislative body, so it's not just limited to the county now. And you might have the same situation in Mount Juliet, although I doubt it. You might have the same situation in Watertown, although I doubt it. Okay. Yeah. The prior, uh, the prior, before that, uh -huh. it said as determined by the board. Are you talking about this board? Yes. It has to be approved. Mm -hmm. That's the board. The whole tenor of these is to you've had a good bit of time where y'all have worked on these sort of things. It's to allow yourselves as much discretion as you can so that you can make decisions. You're always having things to happen that you couldn't anticipate, and that's one of the dangers of having written policies. And uh, that's what puts you in a situation where you have the authority to exercise discretion. Another change on item five we had an item in our previous policies that uh, stated that audited financial data is required on all projects unless otherwise laid by the board. Um, you all have set in on many except for key bond approvals, and we do not attest to the financial status of the company. We let the bank issue the letter of credit and the other financiers involved do that so we don't get into dissecting their balance sheet. So what we're saying here, instead of saying required, we're saying that the board may require an order to financial information on the project. So it gives us that opportunity to do so if we feel like we should. I know when the Bible part came along, there were some questions about how financially viable they were, and we were about to get into that until they pulled away. Um, so down under Section 9, we've done some verbiage change in there. We've added some without striking. A charge to support the activities of the board will be borne by the borrower, paid, by the, paid to the board upon the issuance of a payment in lieu of taxes agreement at the following rate. A lot of times we've gotten into these industries now that come in and they do not issue bonds, but they go through uh, regular bank financing and because they meet the requirements under the payment in lieu of taxes, uh, we have to approve them at, under a pilot. So we weren't really, we caught them all, but we didn't, it wasn't really in the bylaws where we could. And in one half percent, of the issue amount up to one million dollars we inserted the word bond issue because that's where that percentage comes from a quarter percent of the bond issue in it for the amount over a million dollars and then we put in this said charge shall not be applied to the portion of any bonds being utilized to refinance an existing indebtedness on previously issued bonds that was in there or notes of the board because a lot of these firms have come in and done their direct finance so we updated that and that constitutes the new indebtedness. Uh, we replaced subsection 3i entirely to read that in the event a project is approved by the board which includes a pilot but does not involve the issuance of bonds, 
anticipated to be sold to the public, the term issue amount shall be defined as the total value of real and personal property of which the board agrees to accept ownership and the charge set out in I above shall be reduced to one-fifth of the allowed amount. Um, the previous statement, and I hope I don't confuse you, but was in the event a project approved by the board which does not involve the issuance of bonds, the term issue amount shall be defined as the total value of property of which the board agrees to accept ownership and the charge set out. So we've got in this, in this real and personal property because we've got taxes on that. And then we added the other two sections, extensions of a pilot due to expansions of the physical structure or additions of equipment shall be treated as original projects and such subject to charges as applicable. So that'd be a new issue. And then subsection there five is issues arising as to individual projects and the charges to be applied, which are not addressed herein shall be determined by the board. So that gives us that discretion to determine what we're basing our fee on. Am I saying that correctly, sir? Yeah, let's, we get bonds rarely, which has been done in the past, but it's not done, done much anymore, where the bonds are going to be registered and they're going to be sold to little ladies and retirement funds and retirees and such as that. Um, we rarely have that anymore. Second thing is the issue of bond, but it's going to be purchased by a bank, a financial institution. You need to put a lot of effort into studying the one that's going to be sold to the public where a financial institution is going to buy the bond. Then you've got less reason, I guess, to review the financial data. Then some of them will do it more and more. This is happening where they do a note, where they issue a promissory note, and it's basically assigned it's to the board and then assigned by the board to a financial institution as additional security collateral. We'll have one of those coming up uh, next month. Then the last one is where they don't really need any financing, where they're going to finance the whole thing in, inside, but they're looking to deed it to the board and they qualify for a plain tax incentive. But they don't really have that. But they have to have the involvement of the board. In those last three instances, the bond premium is reduced to one-fifth of what it'd be for bonds that are going to be sold to the public. Well, it appears to me that we got all sorts of issues. <laughs> uh, and there's, for instance, I don't understand it. I'm sure you, all of you folks do. But 3i. In the event a crop project is approved by the board, which includes the development bond, the interest bond, blah, 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 uh, shall be sold to the public. And then it goes on down there talking about the personal property. And that is in no different. What, what we do about years and years and years of depreciation and the change in value of some of this property and these huge buildings that Somebody might want to up and buy for nothing, as opposed to what? What do we do at all that? If somebody comes along and buys it, yeah, somebody don't don't in their another in their company right now want to take over that uh, one of those big buildings down there. Yeah, I'm talking about the racetrack. Yeah, and we didn't do the racetrack. Racetrack was done. I no, no, I'm not the racetrack. The uh, what do they call it? Well, any of those big, huge buildings down there that... Well, you just charge a premium when you do the original issue. Yeah. If, if somebody's going to come in and buy the bonds or buy the property and... Of course, under the, under the proposals, under most of the bonds that we would issue with leases and such as that, they got a right to sublet it to somebody else with the approval of the board. But we'll, we agree that the board will act reasonably, have a good reason to turn it down. Um, that's something that's going to happen occasionally. But um, understand that the way it's been worked right now, it's, I think since the Dell issue, and that was, yeah, you, haven't had, you haven't had any issue, any pilot that ran up for seven years. So you're not talking about 
much depreciation, particularly in regard to land and structure, but are you talking about some depreciation with personal property? You would be talking about some. But again, it's limited seven years, and it's, in the past it's been limited to the formula that the county put together that D.C. was talking about there on how long they'd be eligible to get a tax break. So but seven years max unless um, the county commission or whoever, whatever governmental bodies, that has to go to the full governmental body to be approved over seven years, not just a budget committee. Well, Al, it may help you a little bit. What we're talking about here, this section is telling us how we, if, how we calculate the bond premium. That's what it says the total for. value of real and personal property. So it doesn't, it doesn't have anything to do with depreciated property. This is on the issuance of the bonds, whatever the bond issuance amount is. And what we used to say is it was the amount of the bonds, but now we've come along with the, with the personal property being involved and they're asking for abatement on it. So we're changing that definition uh, from the issue amount now we'll define the issue amount as the total value of real and personal property, whereas the previous paragraph only said a real property. Or it says total value of property, and we don't define what that is. So we're adding the two together now to be sure we're specific about it as far as what the premium is being. Well, I'm sure you'll do it well. Well, it comes down to it that the original board premium that's up there before you take one-fifth of it, we're, we're not competitive. Way up north. And because there's not very many bonds that are coming through to be issued to the public, that's uh, why most of them, the premium is going to be divided by five. That makes us more competitive than with other communities. Not everybody charges the board premium. The health and ed board that met here last night, they don't charge the board premium. This is something y'all have charged to be able to build some funds to be able to use for extraordinary circumstances to help job development that's the current building. Projects have changed quite a bit where you know, Ross here was here and there's been a five or six million dollar project in the 60s. Now we're dealing with million square foot buildings that are a hundred million dollars. So the percentages or the bonds that you issue or the percentage based upon real and personal property is a really large number yeah. and that that's not what other industrial boards are charging but one of the things we're building 700,000 and then square foot buildings and that was not the case when these policies were sort of put in place so and that's I, one thing that has changed that and I think that's an ongoing project of the subcommittee is to try to continue to update these fees to be competitive and in line so that might be something else we need to look at pretty soon in the future because I hadn't thought of it that way but you know we used to sit here 20 years ago and somebody come with a four or five million dollar project that kind of blew our socks off a little bit then you turn around you got an Under Armour and they're coming in with a hundred million dollars and you just kind of go duh uh, and one other thing I might interject it now we did, we're not recommending it at this time, but uh, there's been a lot of discussion. Uh, other counties are giving property away to industry, and that's because they bought it at a reduced price, they put infrastructure on it, they built value in it, and they had money to pay the flat price for the property unapproved, and the cities or the counties extend the utilities. One thing that uh, we, I think it's Rutherford County doing is they're taking 15% of the bond premium off of each, now 15% of the tax abatement off of each project that's given and putting it in a separate fund as an enterprise fund and use of building that fund to buy property. So instead of 100% of the tax abatement uh, coming uh, to the company, 15% of that tax abatement would go to the board to set aside for that future investment company would get 85% of the tax abatement. <coughs> and the problem is I think they did it for Nissan, but we can't confirm that they're doing it for folks now. Well, I, I've got a head of Davenport that's on my board at the bank. is also on the ID board of Rutherford County, and they got $6 million from Nissan last year. 
because they did some additional improvements on the site over there and that was the premium that they got from that. And he said, you know, it's not hard to build a fund to buy a property when you get them six million dollars a year. Uh, happened, but we need to leave that open, but look, don't let me cloud the discussion. Well, we we I understand we lost that can cook or whatever you call that tire company. Can cook? Because they just up and gave them the plant property. And uh, same thing with we've got three hundred and thirteen thousand dollars in the bank, and we talked about months ago that we were going to invest in something. Hell, if we uh, bought some high-priced commercial property somewhere, maybe we could have given them the land, and we got the can coop the tire company. That's what we're trying to work toward in the future. We just can't do it overnight. You can't pay for it with one time money. You got to identify, and that's what we've been looking for, is trying to identify for some continuing sure. source of funds. Yeah. Long term residual income. Right. Yeah. And that's the only thing we've come up with thus far is, is discussions about adjusting the incentive program. And some counties, uh, Coffee County, Manchester, their regular pilot program, if you go there, everything's a 20 year. Right? It's a five million dollar project, you get 20 years. It's a hundred million dollars. And it's 50, 60, 70 percent of payments. They have that 20 year flow of money coming in and they can be invested in infrastructure. Uh, we did our program, it's just to give the company the greatest benefit over the shortest period of time and get as much money on the tax roll as quickly as you could. And that was sort of our thoughts. Working on it and get it and it's yeah, uh, if, if the elected folks want to take another look at that, we'll certainly look at it. But that's sort of the, you know, the, the theme of our program is give them a break on the front end, be competitive, and give them paying for taxes. But other counties do it different ways. And I'm glad ours is limited to seven years, so when they come and ask for 10 or 15 or 20, we go, you know, not, not, not something we're playing at. But they do have that continual flow of money. If they've got eight or ten pilots out there, they've got any one time eight or ten pilots paying somewhere in a twenty year term. What's number twelve? Number twelve is uh, as we had it, any bond issue which has been given approved by this board must be issued within one year from the date approval is granted. Should the bonds not be issued within this time frame, the applicant may petition for additional time. We just kind of wanted to update that statement a little bit by saying the resolution authorizing the project then approved by the board shall lapse unless the transaction is closed within one year after the date of approval of the resolution unless the board grants additional time. So we're saying in that that it will lapse at the end of the year unless they come to us and ask for additional time so you don't end up with a lot of approvals laying out there and they don't want Next section we had the board will not consider any application to purchase equipment and or pictures for any retail staff establishment unless it's included in an initial application for construction of the building. We chalked that out and put in all issues not fully determined by the charter bylaws or policy the board shall be determined. So we we take over that ability of responsibility. We change general requirements under section one, bond financing by the board should complement conventional financing. The original section read industrial revenue bond finance must complement conventional financing and not compete with it. The board may at its discretion require documented evidence that the project cannot succeed except for the issuance of the industrial revenue bonds. Back in the early years we had a lot of friction because these bond issues were competing with the local banks and local financing. So we just simply state now that bond finance by the board should complement conventional finance. Be it through letter of credit, issuance bond, whatever. And then under and now uh, we'll take discussion on it, but we've decided to leave item two right there as it is that members of the board serve without pay. Right under item number five, uh, this policy may be 
changed and or amended any time by the majority of the board after written notice to all members 10 days prior to any meeting to consider any change or amendment. We changed the time frame on that. Uh, now we've got the email and everything else involved. So this policy may be amended at any time by a majority of the board after written notice of the proposed amendment is delivered to the members <coughs> at least five days prior to any meeting to consider such amendment. We shortened from 10 to 5. However, a waiver of a policy provision as to a particular project may be made by a majority of the members without prior notice. Let me tell you what all that sums up to is that uh, where we're most likely to get caught by the auditor is not a violation of state law, not a violation of bylaws, but a violation of our own policy. And we had those issues, type of issues, arise in computing the premium for some of these when they were converting from bonds to notes and such as that. So, um, again, this is designed to give you a leeway to adjust and hopefully avoid auditor findings. And then one final change. Note the attorney's fees. Uh, attorney of the board for the board is Robert Rochelle. Uh, North Castle Heights Avenue. It was Castle Heights Avenue North. City changed. And we, so we caught up with them. We put in the area code and we also changed it from a standard fee to a statement that says his fee is subject to negotiation between the attorney and the applicant. So we have nothing to do with what attorney's fees are there, that's his business with that. And realistically, same thing as with the board premium, we got to stay competitive. And so um, that's what I do when I discuss this with bond council. We've never had a project to be turned away because of the attorney's Any other questions, suggestions, requirements? I didn't mean to turn it into a monologue, I'm sorry, but I don't know how else to do this pretty much. Uh, Appreciate the presentation. But the uh, board, you know, Central Rochelle did a good job with the minutes of each meeting that we had. We detailed it out and, and talked about it, and after we got through, that's that's where we are. So you've already made a motion on the bylaws, now we need a, uh, on the statement of board policy approval of the suggested changes. So, Got a motion by Mr. Bryant. Second. Got a second by Don. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. The motion carries unanimous. Thank you for your time. If there's any other yep. business. Yep. 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 All right. Got <laughs> Almost uh, made it, guys. Yeah. <laughs> I sent you a late email. I must not got it. I didn't. We got two big projects that are going to be ready for your consideration the middle of November. And um, of course, one of them is the Under Armour, which is going to be between 100 and 128 million dollars, I think. Um, the other one is um, Nova Met, and I've forgotten the amount on it. It's a, but it's a pretty significant. What is that? Yeah, that was Where is Nova Met? Nova Met purchased the manufacturing facility on the Toshiba Manufacturing. The okay. Moscow Deli bought the 400,000 square foot yeah, that warehouse. Yeah, that's as big as I thought it was. I don't think, yeah, I think it's only six, eight million dollars. Maybe it's that's not very big. It's not very big. What I was, uh, I sent emails to the lawyers today saying if they could give me some idea as to when they thought they'd be ready for a board meeting, that possibly we could have one board meeting and um, take care of both of them at the same time, consider both of them at the same time. Oddly enough, they both came back in saying um, they could go anywhere from the, to the week before Thanksgiving to the uh, first week of December. And we, I don't think we'll have to have a second hearing on it, although it's always possible. You know, we got down last year where we agreed to 
to meet the last week of December unless the project fell through with the Hollister project, I think the first one. And it fell through, I didn't have a meeting, and then went back and redid everything again. So, um, what I was going to ask you to think about is having a meeting. Well, Thanksgiving is on Thursday the 27th. I think they would all be ready on Monday the 24th or Tuesday the 25th. How does anybody, how does that conflict with anything? Okay. Right. How does 25th is fine. How's the 25th look? 25th is best for me. Okay. Is that okay with everybody? It's okay with me. I'm good. And you're proposing 4 o'clock or so? Yeah, I'd suggest, I mean, y'all got things to do. I hate to take you away from your work any more than we just have to. So. Four o'clock, okay? And here at the office. Yeah. All right, well, I'll notify them tomorrow. It makes it a little tougher to get all the documents approved. They're getting them all read and back and forth between the lawyers. But, uh, and I got another one on December the 1st, so it's gonna be, it's gonna be busy there <laughs> in the November. But that's okay to set that one down. Yeah. And that'll, I think that's all I got. Anything else that comes before the board at this time? Well, you might, Mr. Chairman, you might advise them of what you did with the Hollister. Do they, do they, you did sign, uh, just to bring us up to speed on that. That was the teacher. Well, you took the real property out of and suspended that, is that correct? Yeah, I'm trying to remember. We did Hollister so many times. Yeah. I, I believe uh, we approved both the real and personal property pilot and because of the school teacher's ownership of the building that didn't feel uh, allow that property to go back on the tax roll full amount. Yeah. Is that the document? That I, think that's, I think that's the case. What it was was that, uh, as I remember it, the, the owner of the land this teacher's retirement fund from California and they decided they wanted to sell the property and uh, didn't ask for a continuation of the pilot. That's correct. And of course under the bond documents that you've approved, they got a right to get out at any time. So, so, so they got out and we, <laughs> we got more tax, we went on the tax roll for them now. So, on the front end they asked for it and we consider all the abatements, and in this case, there's no such big deal. We won't sell the property, so we go up to, I think it was $250,000 or $275,000 during those two or three years. It's not unusual for them to have a bond issue like that. Yeah. Yeah. A leader who, who, in making relocation decisions, that's his specialty, and he gets them these deals, and I know that's the second time it's happened anyway, he gets them the deals and the pilots are all done and then they move him someplace else because <laughs> his specialty is getting the deals done. We had a company that um, uh, they went on for a couple of years and we all were wondering when are they going to close this thing out. They would hit close it out. They, we finally found out that the guy that had worked all the details had moved on and they didn't, they brought in some other new honcho and he didn't know what was going on, so mm -hmm. he just carried on. We, so. we didn't bring it to their attention. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, so, he's on the tax roll. We, if y'all are happy with it, we are too. So, <laughs> so we, and some of them, when they're looking at the incentive plan, and they're not considering the expenses, um, the guy that's there right then, he's looking at, at how much can I say I got them a break for? When the next guy comes in and they look at how much they're having to pay Bass Beer and Sims or Boat Cummings and how much they're having to pay in a board premium, um, you know, the accountant, uh, underwriters, and all those folks, we've had one or two to do it even though we couldn't figure out how they were getting any tax, any advantage really. But a lot of them will. 
slow down at that point. I think you had 13 approved and three of them. You had 13 approved, only seven have gone through the, the industrial board. And, and two of those, and two of those now are, have, have ended. So we have five active pilots out there. Now, if the center has two more coming in, that will get it back up to seven. But they're in transition there for about a year if, there's, you know, if they really want to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, let me tell you also, um, we may have somebody else to come in and say we've got to rush it through at the end of the month and get it through by the 1st of January. What I always tell them is we will do our best to get it done. And so, um, like last year, we had to set a contingent meeting right there at the end of the year just to sort of go with the job, I guess. And so uh, we don't encourage them to do that, but occasionally they're, they're, they're calling the shots, basically. One other thing real quick, when we were looking at to, trying to maybe get 15% of the tax taxes abated put into a fund to invest, we had GC go back and look, and since 2006, Total taxes abated during that eight-year period is eight million three hundred ninety-one thousand five hundred eighty-five dollars, and we were looking at what fifteen percent of that would be to put into a fund. And, you know, it comes out to right out of a little over a million dollars. So that's why we did that. But that's what we've done since that uh, and that's formula assuming, was adopted. And that's assuming all thirteen of those go through the process, right? Yeah. That's just a little. Bit. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. I'm glad to say I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>